Jerry Tucker dedicated his life to promoting rank-and-file control and to revitalizing the labor movement. He died in October of 2012, and we present here exclusive footage never seen before of Jerry Tucker in the 1990s. In January of 1992, Jerry Tucker and auto workers in the New Directions Caucus allowed Labor Beat to videotape their discussion. Tucker discussed what to do about auto jobs running away to Mexico. As far as what's going on with Ford Motor Company and for that matter the other two of the big three uh, regarding Mexico and the building of new plants in Mexico, replacing our jobs, taking our work to uh, that, that country, um, the corporations of course are going to be looking for the opportunity to be competitive. That's a, that's a basic uh, a component of corporatism. And I guess the question that comes up most often in our plants, it certainly has all along, is what's the role of the union in this, in this question? And so as the big three automakers have decided to shift uh, reasonable amounts of production steadily to Mexico, what's there to force them to be accountable? It certainly isn't for Mexican <clears throat> consumption. Uh, the Mexican auto workers we've met with, and I recently attended a conference in Mexico, which, by the way, the UAW did not participate in, with the major local leaders of the Mexican auto unions, um, point out that they've historically had an industry. They've had plants in Mexico, Ford, General Motors, Chrysler, have had plants in Mexico for almost 50 years, serving their market. And what's happening now, though, is not building plants in Mexico to serve their market. One of the most interesting things about <laughs> workers in Mexico is they don't have parking lots mm -hmm. at their plants. They, they're brought to the plants by bus because none of the workers can afford to buy the products they're building. The automobiles that they're building and sending back into this country uh, and having some sales in their country as well are out of reach of the workers who build the cars because they make wages on, in most cases under a dollar an hour and that they would like very much to enter into uh, agreements and understandings with the U.S. auto workers and the Canadian auto workers uh, for coordinated bargaining to raise their wages, to raise their benefits. They understand that they can't accomplish that all in one, one round or in a, in a very short period of time, but rather than compete for our work, they would like to have an understanding with our union, the Canadian auto workers, that essentially what they're doing is trying to raise all of the standards of all of the workers in this hemisphere. That would, that would be, uh, I think, an appropriate response. We ought to have a union in this country that at least has the same approach as the Canadian auto workers, which is towards coordinated efforts on the part of, of all the unions in this hemisphere. Tucker also opposed whipsawing the practice of pitting one auto plant against another and of making workers compete with each other over who could create more profit for the company. Because for over 10 years now, our national leadership has, has literally been in the hip pocket of the corporations in terms of the, of the uh, competitiveness argument. They accepted the argument on competition and have altered our collective bargaining agreements to the extent that the agreement contains all types of, of concessions to the corporation to have workers compete with each other, both in each plant as well as between plants. That's called whipsawing. Uh, this whole matter of whipsawing one plant against another. Most recently, we've read about it between two General Motors plants. After General Motors announced this, this fateful, painful announcement that they were going to shut down, 21 additional plants, that's in addition to 30 that they'd already shut down since 1985, 21 additional plants and lay off an additional 74,000 workers. Then what they did is put these two plants, an assembly plant in Arlington, Texas, and an assembly plant in Ypsilanti, Michigan, on display in front of uh, our entire membership, and in fact, for that matter, the entire uh, American public, as like two gladiators out in a, in a ring somewhere, and they're being in effect, told by the corporation, each of you is going to have to offer us a better bribe. The union bought competition, and so now the company is giving us competition. They have Arlington workers, Ypsilanti workers, fighting each other, 
both communities behind the workers are offering tax breaks and the governor of Texas has said we'll buy a whole fleet of automobiles from you if you'll, if you'll continue to build here and of course the community leaders in Ypsilanti are saying well we'll match your offer and up it. Well, what's really happening is the corporations are getting away like bandits. Jerry, right. as far as as far as the that situation between the Ypsilanti plant and the and the uh, plant in Arlington, Texas, do you feel that they should be allowed to be uh, commenting back and forth as far as chairman against chairman, local against local, or would you, as far as if you were if you were uh, uh, head of this this UAW, uh, that you would take it upon it to take it over by Solidarity House and oversee? the concessionary uh, mode that, that they are being put in right now because whoever wins as far as who's going to get, get the plant that's going to be allowed open, the workers there aren't going to win because once they've given concessions, concessions, concessions and the decision has been made, they cannot get none of those concessions back. They will be the losers even though they will still be open. Um, how, how do you view that? Well, unwinding this whole strategy of allowing workers to feast on each other and to compete the way that, that you currently see in, these, in this illustration of the two plants isn't going to be a matter of declaring an edict or sending out an executive order. The union is going to have to re retrace some steps and undo some uh, missteps that they've made. And it's not going to be a question that they can just Solidarity House today, the union headquarters today, could not declare that competition was no longer going to be our strategy and therefore it all stops now. It doesn't work that way. If you're halfway over a cliff, if you're falling, you don't just suddenly stop and, and fly back the other direction. The union would have to do a lot of things right now and, and, and amongst those would be to get together the leadership of all the locals in the auto industry and have the kind of honest and truthful discussion about the mistakes that have been made by the union the misplaced strategy of cooperation and corporatism which has allowed the corporations to take advantage. We tied ourselves to their apron strings. We're paying the price for it now. That would require a very honest leadership to say to the membership at large and to organize amongst the leadership of all the locals, many of whom by the way have been bought off as you well know mm -hmm. and they're, they're operating now with their own agenda in many of the local unions. They're being are being treated to uh, certain kind of benefits uh, and gratuities from man local management that the membership it's at large doesn't share at all. So this would be a very difficult task. When the union uh, literally jumped over into the carpet bed, they took a lot of baggage with them. And it would not be easy to just say, well, we won't have it anymore. It isn't a I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you type of proposition and you're suddenly out of bed. At this point, there'd be a lot of work to be done, but the in essential ingredient would be taking the case back to the membership and saying to the membership, look, here's the problem. We've been a part of the problem, but we now want to correct that problem. Let's work together to do it. That would be the only way to do it. Well, Tucker also it's criticized it's jointism, uh, where workers take part in productivity uh, planning uh, with uh, management. Uh, these strategies have allowed the union to create a two-tier uh, within itself. Mm. There's a privileged group within the union, a much smaller group, but a very privileged group of international representatives and local union elected and appointed persons who enjoy a certain relationship with the corporation and a certain standard that the workers on the shop floor don't enjoy. As a matter of fact, I think all of you are aware, you've seen it, I've heard many of you talk about it before, that in today's auto assembly plants, the line speed is much faster than it was, say, 15 years ago. Absolutely. And Especially that, at Ford's. At Ford, it's particularly a, a problem. As a matter of fact, Ford has historically been much harder to drive uh, uh, the line speed. And the standards uh, complaints that we might have been able to address 10 years ago aren't even being addressed at all today. And that's not only from the top, where you have a certain amount of negligence, but it's certainly right there on the shop floor at the committee level that you don't find the will to address these kind of problems. And part of that is this who gains by jointness question that we're talking about here today. Not only do the national union leaders gain uh, and, and are able to perpetuate themselves politically because they have this, this virtual army of patronage that's been appointed and, and some of the elected officials certainly are right in the middle of all of that at the local level, 
but the local leadership too, where they want to, find that they've got themselves some nice rocking chair opportunities too. But in the meantime, the workers on the shop floor are paying the price for this. Workers are working much more frustrated. It's a manage my, my stress system, as, as some have said in the past. What do, you, what do you mean by management by stress? Well, it's just the very, very question of pitting workers against each other. This whole team concept that's been introduced uh, in, in our plants today, of, which is, is argued for as if it's a better way to produce and workers have more control over what they do, that's bunk. Workers don't have more control under the team concept. The only thing they have control over is pushing each other harder. And the very fact of the so-called team concept, which is, a, is euphemistic in this sense, it doesn't mean teamwork in a nice way at all. What it means is ever greater pressure on one another to produce more. It, it actually has the effect of cutting back on the number of workers that do the same amount of work. So while there is a certain comfort zone or level of comfort that's been achieved by the union's uh, agreement on the question of jointness or cooperation, some call it the partnership, uh, it doesn't really positively affect the rank and file members. The rank and file members are worse off today as a result of the strategy of jointness than they were before. Larry Solomon, president of a UAW local in Decatur, Illinois, explains why he opposed jointism. Well, it, what it turned out to be was a ploy. You know, a jointness program was set up through the 86 negotiations, and it took us uh, almost two years to ever uh, get it into place because Caterpillar would not agree that if our members came up with ideas on how to reduce the number of employees on a job, they wouldn't agree to find those workers' jobs somewhere else in the plant. They said that they should be de dedicated enough to go right out on the street and take the layoff and be that dedicated to Caterpillar. And I mean, that was ridiculous. We'll return to Decatur later. Well, all these concerns that we've been talking about today, uh, uh, particularly the concern of the, the disappearing UAW and what, what that's meant for auto workers, specifically in American society generally, all these concerns that are expressed here today were developed into a program in 1986 and in Region 5 in the New Directions Movement, which uh, many of us have, have joined because of our, our interest in union democracy. Uh, you go to the convention in 86 as the flat-out leading candidate for region director. What happened? Well, it's, it's true. I did was certainly the leading candidate. I had a 60-vote lead uh, going in, and that, that had been developed by uh, a large group of local union leaders and members uh, in my region. They had asked me to run. I was then the, assist, the assistant director of the region. They drafted me, in effect, to run. I was subsequently fired for agreeing to run from the staff position, but we had the lead, and when we got to the convention, we saw the might, the power, the, the, the naked uh, aggression of the national leadership in action. Uh, delegates were threatened, delegates were co-opted in, in some cases, and so effectively what they did is steal the election. I knew when the votes were cast that at that very moment I could see people out there who were raising their hand and casting votes who weren't elected delegates, and I questioned that. Uh, the, the Constitutional Convention agreed with me the following day when I raised a protest. The Convention overwhelmingly re refused to seat the incumbent director to allow Owen Bieber to install that, that individual. Bieber, though, uh, didn't accept the verdict of the Convention. Uh, he played for time, and on the final morning of the Convention, simply told everybody that it was over as far as he was concerned. I had lost, even though the vote count showed a separation of only uh, less than two-tenths of one percent, or one vote, of one percent of one vote. Um, and he said, uh, when asked from the floor, what does, what does Brother Tucker do? He said he can do whatever he wants to do. He can take his complaint outside. So Owen Bieber directed me, in fact, in fact to go outside the union. Well, I did. I uh, retained the services of my good friend and, and a really well-known labor lawyer by the name of Chip Yablonski. Uh, that would be the son of relation the, to Jake. Yeah, Jock Yablonski's Jock. son, Jock. murdered mine worker leader, his son. And we took, 
We took uh, our case to the Department of Labor, and within a fairly short period of time, the Department of Labor had filed three separate lawsuits against the International Union for misconduct in that election, for in fact defrauding me out of the, out of my victory. The uh, International, rather than agreeing when all the evidence was laid before them, delayed the actual uh, result of, of that lawsuit for as long as they could. They used, you know, half a million dollars of union dues money to delay the, the ultimate, the outcome of that. About two years later, the federal courts finally ruled, as, as we knew they had to, that the election had been illegal and that I had been cheated out of the opportunity to serve and the membership had been cheated out of the opportunity to have me serve. So we had a new election. I won became regional director. The moment that I was uh, declared the victor, Owen Bieber, uh, in his installation, he, he had to install me as a new director at that event, uh, turned his back, didn't offer to shake hands or anything uh, that would have been conciliatory in nature, turned his back and convened a staff meeting of the staff that was to work for me in the region and advised them that they weren't to take orders from me, that they worked for him, and that he would assure them that he would aggressively uh, campaign as he expected them to do to remove me at the following, at the convention, which was to follow eight months from them. So I had been denied uh, over two thirds uh, of my term, uh, then faced uh, the very uh, undemocratic prospect of having the international not acknowledged the membership's choice. Uh, following that, of course, Bieber convened his national staff uh, and advised them that they were to put up $500 apiece to build a war chest, as he called it, and was quoted in the paper calling it, uh, to defeat me. Of individuals in our region, some 125 who attended a meeting, drafted up a set of statements, which at the outset were, were just titled, A Call for New Directions. That was the working title of this uh, set of resolutions drawn up, and they were fairly simple. They said that collective bargaining is too important to uh, be given over to the corporation's agenda. We want, if we're going to cooperate with anybody, we want it to be a two-way street and so forth. Pretty simple stuff, but it was the very root of what's now the national movement for new directions that began then. Uh, in 1989, over 550 people at their own expense came to St. Louis for the founding uh, conference of the National New Directions Movement in the UAW, and, and we formally uh, began what is now, uh, we're in our third year of being a national movement. In 19, uh, uh, 1990, when local unions uh, elections, the triannual elections came around, uh, New Directions candidates for presidents in, in uh, locals in this country won in local unions that represent over 80,000 members. And so we have grown, uh, we've developed our program, we've developed our ability to reach the rank and file membership, and we're taking on the issues. And the question of now having a candidate, in this case myself, and perhaps we'll add other candidates as we go along, and the question of, of challenging the leadership is anchored in one fundamental concern. And it's not the matter of just replacing one leadership with another leadership. It's the fundamental concern we have is the role of the rank and file and whether or not the rank and file membership should be empowered and should have given to them the opportunity to run their own union. Jerry Tucker did not win the election against UAW President Bieber in 1992, but his ideas spread to union members in other industries. We met up again with Jerry Tucker in 2005. He talked about his in-plant strategy, which was adopted in 1992 by the union at A.E. Staley Corn Processing Plant in Decatur, Illinois. By the time I got to Staley in 1992, when the Staley worker local called and asked if I would participate with them, their situation was, was absolutely ready for, well, let me put it this way, they were certainly not ready to go on strike. Uh, a strike. They could have been ready to strike, but the workers being on strike would not have resulted in a victory. They had no chance of winning a strike, and they knew it. In 1994, after Staley locked out the union, the workers sat down in the street in front of the plant. Here is Jerry just after he himself was pepper sprayed. 
cops started pushing us and then uh, started shooting a mace at us and he, he shot, shot me right in the face, almost directly in the eyes from less than a foot away. Uh, it's been, I don't know how many minutes now, a half hour maybe even. I haven't even been able to see. Burning throughout my face, but particularly in my eyes. Were any of, were any of the protesters holding any, any threatening thing or weapon? No threat was, uh, was uh, intended at all. We were standing very still, basically, just gently, gently holding our ground, and they started pushing. It, what made me sad about that, and it was going on, as you know, the start of, they started before the new voice came into place, and the, and the new voice really did represent something new and different, and, and to be... Just the new voice was when Sweeney first came into the, right. the AFL, and, and I, I think what you're pointing out too now is that the Staley struggle was central to kind of what people saw was going to come eventually of the, of the Sweeney leadership. Well, I'm not going to be prepared to say that it was everybody was at that stage sure. making that kind of a judgment. That's certainly not the case. But I, uh, I think the new voice is representation of what it was going to do different than the moribund Kirkland period. I mean, I was worked in Washington before I, for all of this in the 70s. I was the UAW's point person on politics and, and legislation in Washington uh, around Lane Kirkland. And uh, what, a, <laughs> what an obtuse guy that was, I mean, in many ways. But, yeah. Uh, here we, here we were now getting this kind of new political momentum going on in the National Union, and the, the word on the street was, hey, the, the new voice is going to fight harder for workers. And uh, yeah, it was a winnable struggle, um, and, and, and the new labor movement that was elected before the struggle was concluded had every opportunity to step in with all the resources that they had at their disposal, the newness the, the freshness of their of their just a new arrival on the scene as leaders at the top and really turned that into a victory that all workers in this country could have could have gained some some strength from sadly that didn't happen